and welcome to this video on OCRA, Chemical Equilibrium. Um, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and basically in this video we're going to give a quick overview of the topic of chemical equilibrium. So this is mainly just for revision purposes. Um, the slides that I'm using here, you can get access to them, um, you can purchase them if you just click on the uh, link in the description box and be able to get a hold of them there. Okay, so like I say, this is dedicated to the OCRA specification. You can see here, um, obviously, the specification points that link to this particular topic. Okay, so let's make a start. Let's have a look at reversible reactions. So reversible reactions are where reactions go forwards and backwards. Okay, and they're represented by this um, kind of harpoon arrow. One going one way, one going the other. So here's a generic example. A and B is in equilibrium with C and D. Okay. So the forward reaction, okay, so initially um, reactants are used up pretty quickly because you've got loads and loads of them, so there's plenty of opportunity for them to collide. So um, basically, um, as the time goes on, their concentration drops pretty dramatically, okay, and this is the graph to show a reactant being used up. But we can look at them as a, a product being produced as well. So initially, uh, products are produced really quickly because reactants are reacting together very quickly as well. But then over time, it then slows down as the level of uh, reactants decreases, and there's a less likely chance of them colliding. So basically, it's just the opposite of a reactant. Uh, and at this point here, when the graph, when both graphs start to flatten out, um, effectively what we've got is the uh, forwards, the rate of the forwards reaction equals the rate of the backwards reaction. And we call this a dynamic equilibrium, okay? So the concentrations, as you can see here, of reactant and product remains the same. You can see that's just going to go flat and that's going to go flat. So we call that a dynamic equilibrium. Okay, You've got to be careful that when we're talking about equilibrium, we're talking about the concentration remaining constant. That doesn't mean the same as the amount of reactant and product is the same. Okay, Because we can see clearly here that we don't have the same amount of reactant and product. We've got totally different amounts. But equilibrium is reached because we've got the, the same concentration of each uh, reactant and product and that's because the the rate of the forward equals the rate of the backwards reaction okay these things only happen in closed systems so obviously this is just a basically a posh word of saying that we have a beaker with a lid on the top and the lid basically stops any stuff from escaping okay so Le Chatelier's principle so this fellow Le Chatelier he developed a principle in which he stated um, what would happen if we change conditions to an equilibrium reaction Okay, so here he is here, handsome chap, um, and um, he basically said that if a reaction at equilibrium is subject to a change, that could be in pressure, temperature, or concentration, the position of equilibrium will move to counteract the change. And if the change in the condition results in equilibrium shifting to the left, we make more reactants. So if we impose a change on a reaction, um, and then that reaction as a result opposes that change, by shifting equilibrium to the left, we're going to get more hydrogen and nitrogen in this particular example for the Haber process. If we do it the opposite way, though, um, if we change the conditions so that equilibrium shifts right, we'll get more ammonia, which is two lots of NH3. Obviously, we get a lot more than that. This is represented, obviously, by the bigger lettering here to emphasize that equilibrium is over to the right. So let's have a look at changing concentration. So if we increase the concentration of a reactant or product, the equilibrium will shift to try and reduce that concentration. So it will do the opposite. Okay, And obviously, if the concentration is decreased, then vice versa. So let's have a look. This system here only works in hom homogeneous equilibrium. In other words, all the reactants or products are in the same state. So let's have a look at this one. So if we increase the concentration of hydrogen, Okay, uh, equilibrium will shift to the right to use up the amount that we've just increased and we'll get more ammonia produced. So in other words, if we take this uh, hydrogen here, increase the amount of that, the equilibrium will try to will shift to try and decrease it. And that means shifting to the right to use it up. And effectively, as a as a result, you get more ammonia being produced. So if we increase the concentration of ammonia, then let's go the other way equilibrium will shift to the left because we're going to increase the amount of ammonia the equilibrium will try and reduce the amount so it would um, effectively break down into hydrogen and nitrogen so we get more of these products if we increase the concentration of ammonia 
Okay, let's have a look at the effect of changing pressure. So if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to try and reduce the pressure. And again, vice versa if we decrease the pressure. So again, these systems only work in a homogeneous equilibrium. So if we increase the pressure, um, equilibrium will shift to the side with the fewest number of gas particles. Okay, pressure doesn't do with gas. This will reduce the pressure and more ammonia will be produced. Okay, so if you can see here, if we increase the pressure, so the, it will shift to the side with the fewest number of gaseous moles. You can see here on the left, we've got four gas moles. And on the right, we've got two. So it'll shift to the right-hand side because it's to reduce the pressure. So it'll move to the side with the least number of gaseous moles. So um, as a result, we do get more ammonia. If we do the opposite, though, if we decrease the pressure, equilibrium will shift to the side with the most number of gas particles because it will try to increase the pressure by doing so. So moving to the side with more gas particles means you've got a higher pressure. So you get more nitrogen and more hydrogen will be produced, and you can see them here. Okay, let's look at the change in temperature. This one's a little bit trickier. So if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium will shift to try and reduce the temperature. You can see a pattern here. So Lissotilia basically said, if we change any one of these, equilibrium will shift in the opposite direction. So if we increase the temperature, equilibrium will shift in the endothermic direction, and this will reduce the temperature. More N2 and H2 will be produced. So let's have a look at this one here. You can see we've got this number. Now this number tells us that the forward reaction is exothermic, it's negative. So if the forward reaction is exothermic, the backwards reaction is going to be endothermic. So if we increase the temperature, equilibrium will shift in the endothermic direction to try and cool itself back down. So in this case, the endothermic direction has gone backwards, so that's why we get more hydrogen and nitrogen. So if we decrease the temperature, same reaction, Okay, if we decrease the temperature, equilibrium will shift in the exothermic direction because it will do the opposite to what you're doing. So it'll try to heat itself back up. More ammonia is produced. You can see the forward reaction is exothermic, so we get more ammonia because the forward is exothermic. Okay, a bit tricky that. You've got to look at these numbers here. These numbers will tell you um, about the, um, if the forward reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So make sure you take note of them. And catalysts. So catalysts have no effect on the position of equilibrium. Remember, they do have an effect on rate. They speed up the rate of reaction, but they don't have an effect on equilibrium. All a catalyst will do is it will speed up the rate at which equilibrium is established. And the reason why is because it speeds up the rate of the forward reaction and the backwards reaction equally. So it has no effect. It doesn't prefer uh, the forward or the reverse. It has no preference. Okay, so like I say, it will speed up the rate at which equilibrium is reached. No effect on yield. Okay, so you've got to make sure you know this bit. All right, okay, so we're going to look at uh, specific examples. We're going to look at making ethanol. You can see here we've got ethene, C2H4 plus water. We make ethanol. Forwards, going forwards, it's an endo-exothermic reaction because it's negative. So it's giving out heat. The uh, conditions, 60 atmospheres of pressure. 300 degrees Celsius temperature, and the catalyst we're going to use is phosphoric acid. The forward reaction is exothermic, so decreasing the temperature will mean equilibrium shifts to the right, producing more ethanol. So exothermic going forwards, decreasing the temperature means it will shift in the exothermic direction, so we get more ethanol. Okay, So actually a lower temperature is a good thing for yield. However, a lower temperature means you get a lower rate of reaction. So yes, you might get a good yield of product, but it'll take you ages to produce. So we come to a compromise, and the compromise is 300 degrees Celsius, and this compromises between yield, the amount we produce, and rate, which is how fast we produce it. Pressure, okay, so pressure, high pressure, so if you look at the gases here, high pressure means equilibrium shifts to the right, so because we've got fewest gas balls on the right. So that means, that um, if we increase the pressure, um, we can effectively produce more of this. And also, unlike this one, increased pressure actually increases the rate. We've got a higher chance of successful collisions. However, it is really expensive to have high pressurized kit. Okay, uh, You need thicker, more robust vessels and pipes. That's going to cost a lot of money. Um, and basically, the compromise is 60 atmospheres of pressure, which is reasonably high. Um, and this is between yield and speed. 
yield or speed. Basically, this is both them and cost. So it's basically how much would it cost to get pressures up to this level? Okay, so this is the compromise that we've got here. And you see, there's quite a few compromises. Okay, so let's look at Kc and the equilibrium constant. So Kc is an equilibrium constant. Uh, basically, we worked out from the molar concentration in a reaction. Okay, so let's have a look at this example here. So we've got a generic equation here. This is A, B, C, and D. Okay, and we've got the molar values in front of each one of these. So you can see we've got two and two. Can be used in the Kc expression. And Kc expression is always products over reactants. Okay, so we take the products of the reaction, which is C and D, divide it by the, um, the uh, reactants, which is A and B. Notice the powers, the powers here are 2 and 2, and that reflects the number of moles in front of each um, species that we are looking at. Notice also the square brackets in here. The square brackets represent the concentration of something. So we're looking at the concentration of C uh, multiplied by the concentration of D, and that's basically the expression for Kc. So you might be asked to write out a Kc expression and calculate the value of it as well. So you can see here that we've got the concentration of sulfur dioxide to be 0.4, concentration of O2 to be 0.2, and the concentration of SO3 to be 0.8. So you can see here there's the reaction that we've got, and we're going to use this to come up with our Kc expression. And there's the expression, product over reactants. Remember, if it's got a 2 in front of there, that's going to be to the power of 2 on the top here. So the calculation is literally you swap the numbers. SO3 we were told was 0.8, so it's 0.8 squared, divided by 0.2 for O2 and 0.8 for S, uh, 0.4, sorry, for SO2, which is this one here. So you've got 0.2, 0.4, that one's got to be squared. Put all them numbers into a calculator and you should get a KC in this example of 20. So we don't need to know how to work out the units for this, but just to kind of give you just a bit of extra information if you uh, if you want to know about it, all we do, because this is a concentration, we do moles per dm cubed for both of them, because we've got squared there, so we have two of them. We have three different parts down here, so we've got that and then them two, so we just write the units out three times, and then all we do is we cancel them out, top and bottom, we're left with, um, we're left with the unit at the bottom here, um, we flip that up to the top, and we invert all the signs, so instead of moles per dm cubed, it's now mole to the minus one dm3. Okay, so we literally just inverted all of the uh, indices at the top there. Again, you don't need to be able to, you don't need to know how to work out units for AS. Um, so, but it's just there for your information. All right, okay, so what affects the value of Kc? So we need to know what the effect is of temperature on the value of Kc. Uh, Kc is only valid for one temperature. Okay, so if we change the temperature, um, this will change the equilibrium concentrations, and obviously Kc will change as a result. So um, if we, uh, so if the temperature change causes equilibrium to shift right, then Kc will increase, and if the temperature change causes equilibrium to shift left, Kc will decrease. Okay. So let's have a look at um, this example here. So in this reaction, the forward reaction is exothermic and the backwards reaction is endothermic. I mean, see here, because our delta H is negative, that's an exothermic reaction going forward. So if we increase the temperature of this reaction, equilibrium will shift in the endothermic direction. So going backwards, this is to oppose the increase in temperature and Kc will decrease. I'll show you an example um, to help you kind of work that out. But basically, if we decrease the temperature, it does the opposite. So equilibrium shifts in the exothermic direction in case you will increase. So let's have a look at this particular expression here. You can see that if I increase these two here, if equilibrium shifts so we get more O2 and SO2, which are our reactants, then the value of KC is going to drop because if I divide by a bigger number, my resultant number is going to be a bit smaller. However, if I increase this number here, then um, basically this is shifting towards the product side, SO3, then Kc should rise. So increasing this number on the top and keeping this one the same, I mean Kc will increase. So it's a bit like a fraction. Just see it as like a fraction. Okay, so we need to investigate some of these, and there's practical ways in which we can investigate equilibria. Okay, so one of them is iron-3 nitrate. And what this does, it reacts with potassium thiocyanate, 
uh, to form iron 3 thiocyanate in equilibrium. Okay, and this is a really good way of showing, it's really colorful this reaction, uh, showing um, basically how the equilibrium happens. So this reaction exists in equilibrium. So we've got iron 3 ions and these are your thiocyanate ions, SCN. Okay, we've got three of them. And basically these are going to bond to iron to form uh, iron 3 thiocyanate, which is this compound here. So the colors of these, this is yellow, this is colorless, and this is blood red. So you've got a big contrast in colors here. And basically we're gonna look and basically prove this equilibrium exists and just prove Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so we've got some test tubes here. I'm gonna go through one each one by one. The first one, this is a control test tube. This is a slight red color present. So it's like a mixture of red and yellow and we get this pale pink color. So this is in obviously in equilibrium and that's our uh, control tubes. So we're going to be measuring everything relative to that. In test tube two, if we add more iron three plus we add more of this, equilibrium is going to shift to the right to use up the amount of iron three that we've, that we've produced. So that means we're going to get more of this and it goes blood red. We get this um, more of this produced. Likewise with if we increase the amount of thiocyanate ions as well, equilibrium shifts right for the same reason. So this test tube goes blood red as well. However, in the last one, if we add more iron, iron 3 thiocyanate, if we add more of this, equilibrium will shift to try and remove this sort of shift in the left-hand side. Now, because this is colorless, we won't see this, but we will see more iron 3 plus being produced as well. So actually, it will turn yellow. Um, we've got more of this stuff, more of Fe3 plus um, and thiocyanate ions um, because equilibrium will shift to the left. So this is just a nice colorful way of showing um, equilibria in action and we're going to have a look at another one this time um, obviously that one we looked at before was changing the concentration um, of your substances so adding more or less of it this one we're going to look at the change in temperature and we can use nitrogen dioxide in this um, and basically this is in equilibrium with N2O4 and it can be used to show how temperature affects equilibrium so here it is here this reaction exists in equilibrium Forward is exothermic, backwards is endothermic. Okay, so we've been just been given this information. Now, nitrogen dioxide is brown, NO2 is brown, and N2O4 is colorless. Okay, so we now know that we're obviously going to get a color change here. So, if we place this in a warm water bath, okay, equilibrium will shift in the endothermic direction. Okay, so if I heat it up, the reaction will try to cool itself down and it will move in the endothermic direction. So by doing this, it will move to the left. Equilibrium move to the left. We'll produce more NO2, which is brown. And so our test tube will go brown and look like this. If I place it in a cool water bath, equilibrium will shift in the exothermic direction to oppose the decrease in temperature. So that means it will shift to the right. We produce more N2O4, which is colorless. And so therefore our test tube should go from brown to a colorless gas being produced. And this is proof that equilibrium um, can be changed with temperature. And that's it. That's the overview of chemical equilibrium for OCRA. Um, please support this channel uh, by clicking on the middle button there. Uh, that will allow you to subscribe to the channel and keep up to date all new videos that we add on. Uh, also, just a reminder, these slides can be purchased um, if you just click on the link in the description box and you can get them there. That's it for now. Bye bye.